I tell any secrets of the Mao Mao, this oath will kill me. If I am called in the night and refuse to come, this oath will kill me. If I see anyone steal white man's property, I must help him. I must hide what he gives me and say nothing, or this oath will kill me. The whole system in this country, the economic system, is such that uh, jobs are scarce. Automation is limiting jobs. It's, it's, it's decreasing jobs. And uh, if autom as automation eliminates the job opportunities, legislation will not create job opportunities. All it will do is bring about friction and hostility between the two races. You, you see, there will be no uh, progressive revival if black uh, folks are not deeply involved in it. I will obey all orders of the Mao Mao, or this oath will kill me. Good evening. Welcome to This Is Revolution podcast. I am your host of the Mao Mao Hour, Pascal Robert. Tonight, we should have a very interesting and rather hot discussion. Unfortunately, due to some technical difficulties, one of our main contributors tonight will not be able to be here. That is Duruba bin Wahab. He is in Africa, and we had some technical difficulties. But we have two very, very uh, good guests, friends of the show, who will be able to make this an intellectually sophisticating and sophisticated and very, very deep conversation. We have Ajama Baraka from Black Alliance for Peace, and we also have from uh, former Green Party vice presidential candidate, and we have Paul McComb, friend of the show, academic professor. I'm going to quick with the introduction because I want to frame the question and give us time to talk because this could go five hours, this subject. Recently, China brokered a peace deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia, something that would have been impossible for the United States to do. China and Russia are clearly forming an alliance that is causing trepidation in the Western world amongst the United States and its NATO allies. There is a current global tide in the air called multipolarity, which is a basic concept that argues that with the rise of China and Russia in the East, and some say with their BRICS alliance, Brazil, Russia, India, China, Korea, that a new polar hegemon is forming in the East to be a counterweight to the Western powers of the United States and uh, NATO. So the question becomes, what are the consequences of the multipolarity? What we're gonna have our two seasoned experts on foreign affairs ask and answer, what does multipolarity mean for the Black and African diaspora in the United States and globally? So first, I'll bring in Paul McComb and my friend, Ajama Baraka. Ajama Good to be here. Good to have you. So Thanks first, you. thank you all for coming. Ramadan Mubarak for all of those who are fasting for the month of Ramadan. So first, we're going to start with you, Ajamu. Ajamu, I would like you to answer the question directly. If you want to define multipolarity differently, that's fine as well. Please explain what are the consequences and what does multipolarity mean for the Black and African diaspora? Define the phenomenon and then go forth Go forth with your answer. Well, I think in as, as simple as terms, the uh, concept of multipolarity means that the uh, predominant uh, domination of the U.S., the short-term domination of the U.S. since the 1990s, when one would argue that there was a unipolarity, a unipolar world, is rapidly coming to an end. That uh, what we have now are um, uh, alternative centers of power developing, uh, what that means as they are developing is that it gives uh, additional options to various nation states. It provides potentially even some uh, political support for uh, organizations 
and movements that are attempting to try to alter their relationship uh, to the dominant states, uh, the states that have dominated the uh, the international order for a few hundred years, and that is the, the what we call the pan-European uh, colonial capitalist white supremacist uh, project. Uh, so it provides some degree of space and some political options. It's somewhat similar, but very, but really different in some ways uh, to the spirit of, of Bandon uh, of 1955, where there was uh, some political space that was opened up uh, as a consequence of the um, anti-colonial struggles um, uh, where uh, states who uh, attempted to, to try to uh, uh, foster an independent foreign policy that was not completely aligned with either the uh, West led by the US or the East led by the Soviet Union and to a certain degree, the Chinese. So this is the, we, what we're seeing is a a shift in the relations of power. Now, I think it's important for us to not overly, to, to not be, to, to not exaggerate what is happening. There are shifts, but the notion that the US and the Western powers um, are unable to, uh, to assert themselves, I think is, um, is countered by what we see with the, the war in Ukraine, uh, and the continuation of reactionary policies around the world uh, in which the U.S. is able to exert, exert its power, imposing sanctions, et cetera, on various states, more than 40. So there is a shift taking place, and it's providing some political space. But uh, as we dig into this, uh, we, can, we can talk about what we can actually do with this new, uh, new political space. All right. Paul. What is multipolarity from your analysis and what does it mean for the black and African diaspora? Uh, good question, brother. Uh, I remember in grad school, one of my areas of uh, concentration in my uh, finishing up my PhD was globalization, global studies at the time. And what the dominant uh, uh, theories of globalization at the time, and we're talking about uh, the late 90s, early 2000s was that globalization represented uh, 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 the continuation of liberalism under the umbrella of neoliberalism with America serving as the hegemonic power. Now, this was juxtaposed uh, against uh, Samuel P. Huntington's uh, clash of civilization model. And what we see, the multipolarity that we're seeing emerging now seems as though it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in which America itself is responsible for this multipolarity, multipolar world that, that is attempting to emerge because of their unwillingness to compromise with post-Soviet Union communities and societies. Huntington in his book, The Clash of Civilization, argues that uh, the, the post-1990 world will be basically characterized by a, a, a clash of different cultural civilizations. He outlines eight cultural civilizations that would be clashing with one another. Now, this, for me, at the time, as a young man in graduate school, this flied in the face of the attempt by the Soviet Union to compromise with the U.S., to form alliances with the U.S., even for the Chinese to form alliances with the U.S. It's as though the, the United States, and we all know Huntington uh, uh, worked with the deep state at the time of his writing of uh, the work, The Clash of Civilization. And it is this reluctance of the United States to, number one, allow Russia coming out of the, so, uh, of the 1990s to join NATO, uh, allow uh, uh, placing sanctions on China uh, post the 1990s, economic sanctions on China. So it's as though America was basically playing out this class of civilization, even though the class, the, the civilizations had not completely constituted themselves on a level with the U.S. at the time that Huntington was writing. So now when we, we forward 
uh, 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 the historical timeline 20 years from the time Huntington was writing to today, what we see is America has framed the contemporary uh, 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 world system as though it is the Anglo-Saxon world. And this is how uh, Sergei Lavrov, uh, uh, Maria Zakharova, as well as Vladimir Putin paints it as though the Anglo-Saxon world have assumed one civilization and their civilization representing democracy, identity, politics. And now you have this, the others in the, uh, in the world system represented by China, Russia, who are, uh, um, who are basically conservative, ultra conservative civilizations who America has defined as autocracies. So now it becomes no longer identity politics, neoliberalism versus uh, 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 the, the, uh, um, the Soviet world. It is now democracies versus autocracies. And what we see for the black world in the diaspora in the in Africa is this potential now to exert some political agency in the face of what America has brought into fruition, this clash of civilization, which for which and for, for Russia and China is reactionary because their failure to be accepted by the West has forced them with no all other alternative but to uh, uh, organize as a bloc in order to constitute a new world order. And this places the African nations as well as the African diaspora in a position to have to choose. Now, I say choose uh, uh, reluctantly because what this, what this multipolar world that America has forced upon the world is demonstrating is the fact that the black diaspora has no agency. They are basically a, a, a comprador bourgeoisie in the West that have chosen, and I'm speaking about the diaspora. Africa, for the most part, they do have a choice. You're starting to see some agency in which Africa is basically, especially when you look at Burkina Faso and Mali, they're starting to exercise some agency against the Anglo-Saxon world. And I like what the Russians are actually doing. By the Russians buying into the American model uh, of cultural civil one cultural civilization, another, by the Russians referring to the Americans in the West, not by the collective West, but by the Anglo-Saxon world, it in a way, it is highlighting the 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 current contradiction and paradoxes that the black world is facing. On the one hand, you have the black diaspora represented in the West by people like Lloyd Austin, Kamala Harris, who, who basically are supporting a neo-Nazi fascist state in which they would be lynched in, but yet they don't highlight the contradictions of that. Ukraine is a neo-Nazi fascist state, a corrupt neo-Nazi fascist state. And you have Kamala Harris, who is in Africa, Ghana, contemporarily right now, uh, basically trying to plead to some of these African countries to side with the Anglo-Saxon world. And then you have the African nations who are revolting against the Anglo-Saxon world. So these are the contradictions that we're seeing now when Russia paints this as a clash of civilization, as America is painting. It's pointing to the fact that we in the Black diaspora do we can we consider ourselves uh, uniquely distinct from the Anglo-Saxon world, the neoliberal identity politics, democracy, Anglo-Saxon world juxtaposed against the orthodox, uh, 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 conservative uh, uh, Eastern world, and with the Africans turning east as well? So I'll, I'll end it at it right there and let go ahead, brother. That's a fascinating paradigm you're putting forth, right? Because the question I ask, my ultimate problem here is that I don't see the Russians and the Chinese offering an ideological project that really challenges the function of capitalism the way the Soviet Union was, at least in the 60s and 70s, when it was willing to actually give arms and support to revolutionary projects on the African continent and Cuba, so on and so forth. 
So my position is that are we actually just bordering between two different types of capitalisms here and we just like what the Chinese and the Russians are offering because we don't have to deal with the bad old annoying racist white boy anymore. We'd rather deal with the new cap capitalist Russia and you know communist talking China who was not really exporting ideological socialism or communism. In other words, what is the ideological project that the, 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 the Russians and the Chinese are offering that in terms of the political economy of Africa, and let's say we'll agree with Paul that the black diaspora is so ideologically wedded to the Anglo-Saxon or European variant of identity that they can't fathom creating any kind of sovereign movement to align with the African or Caribbean nations to break away from that pole, the question becomes, what is to entice them to do that if there's no ideological project coming out of Russia and China that breaks away from the traditional fact or function of neoliberal capitalism? Is that addressed to me or a Jammu? Jammu, you want to jump? You want to jump on that? Yeah, let me let me let me jump in here. I mean, this is this is very interesting, a very interesting framing, and it's interesting um, uh, that uh, we started off by looking at this this framework of the clash of civilizations um and i'm glad that that we are moving toward uh, we look at that but moving toward uh the the concrete kinds of material analysis that we also have to introduce into the into the conversation um looking at these issues of, of class and political economy uh it it, it the the ideological project is a very important question because even with this uh, move towards so-called multipolarity uh, there's almost an assumption that uh, that represents some kind of, of, of progress for those uh, nations and peoples who are still being subjected to the the ravages of global capital and global capitalism uh, if the multipolarity uh, uh, that we are moving toward remains a, a multipolarity in which the predominant uh, uh, means of exchange and accumulation continue to be on the basis of, of capitalism, then how much, pro how much progress are we talking about? This ideological project is not going to come from either one of those states. Uh, these are two states who are pursuing their own particular uh, national interests. Um, the Russians, of course, are not in any way, uh, uh, socialist, if you will, uh, and even the socialism of, of China uh, is a uh, socialism that has not yet entered a phase where uh, they feel compelled to uh, give substantial support uh, to some of the emerging non-capitalist and pro-socialist projects on the planet. Their relationships that they are building with many of these nations is a, a quite pragmatic one. Uh, the the ide ideological components is usually uh, missing. Uh, so this ideological project has to emerge from the bottom up. It has to emerge as part of the of the peoples in these various nations and regions, uh, uh, making the determination that they are no longer going to um, uh, attempt to subsist in a global. Uh, economic system in which not only their dignity is under assault, but their very ability to survive uh, is threatened. So the alternatives are there and people are beginning to explore those alternatives. So that that ideological and political project will emerge from the people and somewhat it, it is emerging from the people from the bottom up and not from the, the level of these various nation states. Uh, oh. I'll have to I disagree. I agree with Pascal to the sense that on the sense that what China and, and Russia represent are uh, is a different variant of uh, um, capitalism. And I'll just and I'll you I'll frame it in terms of what Pascal did last night on the Haitian Revolution. Pascal pointed the fact that during the Haitian Revolution there are three options open to uh, uh, Dessalines in 1805 when he's trying to constitute a nation state. The Laku system of the Africans, the mercantilism uh, of the Creole Blacks, and the liberal capitalism of the uh, mulatto elites. 
And the way I see the multipolar system emerging is this choice now, uh, 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 out, when you remove the Laku system, which is a form of communism, uh, communal living, when you remove that, I see what China and Russia are offering against the US is a form of mercantilism or protectionist capitalism versus the neoliberal model with this emphasis on uh, uh, a small state, deregulation, financialization, et cetera, versus a protectionist state form of capitalism in which protectionist measures are put in place to provide social services uh, to the masses. So it is this alternative, this mercantilist or protectionist model, and it's very important that we understand it, I believe, this way, because in the 1930s, there's an anthropologist by the name of Carl Polanyi who's trying to understand the responses of the uh, 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 of the European countries to the liberalism that America was trying to promote globally, the liberal capitalism that America was promoting. And he referred to the protectionist mercantilist uh, uh, form of capitalism that would emerge in the in the European countries as a form of fascism and protectionism. It's a reactionary response to the commodification of land, labor, and money. And we have to view it in the same light, or I would say America views the emergence of Russia, the protectionist capitalism, the mercantilist capitalism of China and Russia as a reaction to the neoliberal model. If we view it that way, we can see that the state form of capitalism that China and Russia they are, are, are exercising or implementing offer an alternative model from the neoliberal project, the hegemonic neoliberal project that America has been trying to implement since the, since the 1990s. So it's in that sense, I believe they do offer an alternative political. Now it's not, it doesn't salvage humanity from the impending uh, 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 climate crisis that we're facing. But it does offer an alternative to what America has to offer post the 1990s. So, I mean, so what you're saying is that the only benefit is that instead of neoliberalization, hyper privatization, gutting of the state, hyper financialization, uh, 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 capitalist instability, boom, bust, boom, bust, or inflation, uh, so on and so forth, what we get is nation state mercantilism where we get this kind of almost return to what the uh paleo conservatives in america would say about protect our jobs at home protect our industry at home do trade but on our terms but how exactly does that help in terms of the development of those african countries that are outside the sphere, the physical sphere of russia and china what makes us think that the mercantilist nature of China and Russia are going to be willing to invest in building stable mercantilist states in Africa or the global south. Uh, I'll let Ajuma go. <laughs> go ahead, Ajuma. Ajuma, and I'll follow. Ajuma. no, no, no. Ajuma. I think that you sorry, to, brother. I'm, I'm sorry. No problem. No, no, I think you got to respond to that because I think it's a, it's, it's, it, it goes right to the the heart of your of your argument. Um, for me, I think they're already doing so. By private, by by nationalizing certain industry, it, it basically paralleled the 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 uh, substitution model coming out of the 1960s in the third world. You privatize certain natural resources, remove those natural resources uh, uh, from what we call the free market. For example, in Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation, it, it, he has what's called fictitious commodities. Money is a fictitious, fictitious commodity. Land is a fictitious commodity. Labor is a fictitious co commodity. So by nationalizing certain resources for the benefit of the people, you remove that from the economic neoliberal model. And we see that's what, uh, uh, and it's up to the African nations to take a position on that. And we see, for example, Eritrea is doing just that. We see that uh, uh, hopefully Burkina Faso will attempt to do that. And this does not, I and mean, I'm not trying to say that China and uh, Russia will not 
go into these countries for their own uh, 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 interests? Of course not. But at the same time, by by having these state models as an alternative to the neoliberal model, it allows the Africans to develop uh, or or uh, uh, open up a different uh, avenue of development for their nation state. And we're starting to see that uh, uh, right now, I believe. So um, it's up to the African nations to to take that into, into account, nationalize certain uh, 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 commodities in their uh, countries and protect those from the, uh, uh, the market system. And at, while simultaneously utilizing Russia as well as China to help them uh, uh, constitute a nation state, constitute social uh, programming for the people. And that will, will be an alternative to the neoliberal project that says you have to privatize everything. Remember, as the, as the leader of the Burkina Faso movement points out, France has been in Africa for over uh, two, 300 years, and they're, still, they're worse off than they were when the French arrived. So at least there is an alternative model. Uh, uh, now, it's a, for me, in keeping with the logic of Polanyi, it is a, a, a response to the exploitation of neoliberalism. It's not, a, it's not a new system. It's not a sui generis system. It's a reactionary model. The mercantilist model is a reactionary model. The protectionist model is a reactionary model. And the only way that it, only way that is, it, it, it might be able to sustain itself is if it's given legitimacy, legitimacy from the people. Mm -hmm. So it not only do you have the the challenge of attempting to try to make some shifts in your economy by nationalizing some of the major uh, uh, commodities commodities you may be uh, attempting to export, which can uh, spark a reaction from uh, the Western nations that are still predominant in very many ways. Uh, you also have the uh, the reality that that these uh, nation states that are involved in this transition are not going to be in a position to really protect the objective human rights and needs of their populations until you you so in this transitional period you still have the challenge of political instability uh you still have the the potential reality of uprisings from the people as a consequence of of their material needs not being satisfied uh, and you still have these various nation states and the ones that are the, the smallest of these nation states still being subjected to the reactionary policies of the still uh, powerful global West. So it's, it's a, you know, why the, this model can be attractive, especially for some of the larger states. Uh, you know, it, 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 there, there are some real specific kinds of challenges uh, when you look at some of these micro states in particular on the African continent and in the uh, uh, Caribbean. Well, this is what this is something that's very because what you what you guys are telling me is that we basically can't expect China and Russia to come and say, "Yeah, guys, we're going to fix all your problems, do everything for you." This is going to take stable participation. <laughs> excuse me, stable participation by the global south at countries, particularly in Africa and South America and the rest of the global south. To be partners with this project now how does that work i mean shout out to burkina faso and the other uh, former french colonies in africa but we still have the kind of comprador bourgeoisie in many of these places we still have countries like haiti that are being destabilized by the west we have coup d'etats in you know socialist projects in latin and south america uh elections being disturbed and so on and so forth how exactly do we, we still live in a Monroe, a Monroe Doctrine Western Hemisphere, how exactly do we facilitate creating the cadre in these uh, Global South countries that can even not only assume benefits from multipolarity, have the sophisticated network of people to create the, 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 uh, capacity to discourse with the Eastern nations on how to implement this since these countries have been under the thumb of the West so much. Is there space for the diasporas of the global South in the West? For example, could we get the Haitian diaspora to create a consensus 
to reach out to the Eastern nations on how to fix the problem in Haiti in terms of bringing in a Haitian military force as opposed to the West? Is that possible? Do we have the sophisticated capacity? Do, does, do, do African-Americans have agency enough to say, we're tired of dealing with the Uncle Sam? Is that, are we so far away in terms of political consciousness where the lethargy of the 50 plus year counter revolution is so bad that people are just waiting to see the Russians and Chinese collapse and go on and buy their McDonald's French fries and Kentucky fried chicken and Popeyes? No, How I think we, that this, this isn't this project requires ideological grassroots building that is good, that's more than just people like myself and others pontificating on podcasts. <laughs> frankly well look on on that on that point and 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 a few of your other previous points uh i'm in complete alignment that basically what we have to and it's going to sound like a cliche but basically what has to happen is that we have to build more effective structures of of coordination we have to find ways in which we can uh we can exercise we can build an exercise agency, and that comes from uh, building more effective organizations. That this change that has to take place is going to be a change that's going to come and, and is coming from the bottom up. Look, there are serious forces, in particular, in 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 our region. We talk about our region, meaning the so-called Americas, uh, that are quite sophisticated, and while they see uh, and recognize. Uh, you know, what the Chinese own ideals about how you, in fact, transform society. And they are uh, uh, in, involved in a serious process of decolonization uh, that uh, is freeing up uh, their ability to be able to look at some of their own traditions, uh, to look at their objective material conditions in a new, uh, in a new and, and creative way, uh, to build uh, new forms of of social interaction and social organization uh, based on uh, values um, and a life project that they, that they believe can help them to address all of the material needs of their people and the cultural and spiritual needs of their people. So th there's, there's creative and progressive politics in our region, more so I would argue in any other region at this point, on this planet, and that's really because of some of the particularities of of the Americas and the the, the stages that various nations have gone through over John, the last couple you, hundred years. John, you've been living, living in Latin and South America for a while. You may be optimistic about there, and I agree with that. We are in the United States, bro. That ain't happening up here. No, no, no. <laughs> well, it actually, actually, it is. It is. There, there, there are there are connections. There are political connections and developments taking place. I would argue, and, and I hope it doesn't come across as, as chauvinistic, but I would argue that one of the most important formations to be to be to come along and to be developed in the last four decades has been the Black Alliance of Peace. I'm a member of Black Alliance yeah, of Peace. Right. I, I have lots of affection for Black Alliance of Peace. How does Black Alliance for Peace develop the cadre to penetrate? the ideological superstructure that has large segments of Black America in such a popular culture fog that they'd rather talk about real housewives of America than <laughs> real politique. Well, you, you, you do it by how we are, are attempting to go along and building it. We have strategically located or strategically identified young people, uh, people uh, in, the, in, in the communities, people who are uh, in schools, people are recent graduates. We are really basing this long-term movement strategy uh, on attempting to incorporate uh, these folks who are, I guess people call them part of Gen Z or something, uh, and the lower elements of the of the so-called millennials. The same people who are raising serious questions about the, the capitalist order, who are more favorable to ideas around socialism, that is the base that we're building, and it's a it's a it's a process that's systematic. Is that is that anything dramatic? Is that these dramatic mobilizations that take place? Uh, it is a process of systematically organizing your alternative forces, and we have no illusions about the difficulties of it. The the Black Alliance of Peace is still a small 
um, aspiring formation. But, you know, we have some of the baddest Africans uh, in this country in that formation. And we have the ability, we're building the capacity to 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 do all kinds of things in various parts of this country. Can we penetrate and transform consciousness? Uh, uh, big, you know, in terms of, of the, the grip that the liberal um, uh, cultural apparatus has on, on, the, on, on, on our people is difficult. No, we can't do that yet. But, you know, the strategy that we are pursuing is a strategy that I think as we uh, continue to build uh, and build consciousness and build structures, that we'll be able to make some, some, some changes and we won't repeat some of the mistakes that were made in other other historical periods. Well, let me ask you. I, 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 learn from it. I don't share. Well, I don't share the the optimism at all. Of course um, not. Yeah. I, I, well, I, I, well, I'm with, university professor. He's yeah. I'm dealing with students who I have to refer to as they, he, she, bro. It's I don't see it. Um, it, it, it might be part of my structural Marxist training. I I, I just don't share the optimism that any revolutionary movement is going to come from the grassroots, especially not in the Western world. Absolutely not. I don't share in that. I, for me, I have more hope uh, uh, in places like the African continent because the ideological superstructures that the West put in place to, to dominate consciousness, I don't think has penetrated the continent to the extent that it's penetrated the diaspora uh, with the exception of Haiti, I believe Haiti is, is an exception in the diaspora to uh, some of the counter movements that may emerge out of Haiti against. Because when you look at Haiti, when the current protest movement you find in Haiti, there is a call among the youth for the Wagner group to come into Haiti to assist and overthrow in the U.S., the same thing we see in, in, uh, on, in some of the countries on the African continent. But I don't share the, the optimism that a grassroots movement will emerge. Uh, uh, I'm, 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 I'm hesitant about Latin America. I'm hesitant about, uh, um, um, I'm definitely uh, uh, pessimistic when it comes to uh, uh, um, uh, the U.S. So I don't share in the optimism that the grassroots are the uh, is the answer to what we're what we're facing in the next 20, 50 years. Well, we have a friend of the show that we've had on the show a couple of times named Daniel Besner. Shout out to Dan Besner. Uh, Dan Besner postulates that um, the ideological superstructures that you know Paul is talking about have come to a point of almost complete uh, total domination, that mass politics is obsolete. His position is that mass politics is even, not even enough to change the consensus of the ruling class because they have so perfected the capacity to either entertain or distract or ignore mass movement politics, that even if we could do the political education and organization, the capacity of the state and capital to either neutralize, deflect, or demobilize has been so perfected that what we were able to do in, say, the 30s, 40s, and 60s doesn't even exist anymore. I'm not saying I agree with that or not. What do you think about that argument that we are beyond the stage of mass politics? I think we it's true to the state. See, we have to stop talking about the state in in the in 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 the sense of uh, uh, the '60s when when in the '70s when Kojev, the '30s, '40s, '50s, '60s, their conception of the state is an all uh, 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 is an he, is a hegemonic order that controls everything. No, just look at the role that private industry is playing in the indoctrination of politics and agency, the interpolation in the bourgeoisie. Image. Just look at our, the mainstream media and the role is currently playing in indoctrinating people about uh, China, Russia, and this war on Ukraine. Uh, it, it's as though what we have to do is supplement the, the uh, 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 
the industrial complex with the media industrial complex. These are this it, we're living in a fascist, a neo-fascist state like America in which ideas are controlled. And to to postulate that somehow grassroots mass movements are able to escape uh, 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 the the cultural hegemony uh, uh, that the state and private industry play in, in determining uh, uh, not only consciousness but agency itself. I I, I don't see it. Um, just look how fast RT was removed from YouTube. Look how fast they block. For example, I'm I was blocked for almost a year on social media. Just because I, I posted about my support for Russia and, and uh, 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 my support for uh, uh, the, my defense of uh, uh, the Russian state against the corrupt neo-fascist state like Ukraine. So we have to look at it as the media industrial complex determining agency itself so that the possibility now, once again, I, I'll excuse myself for my structural Marxist training which prevents me from seeing the possibility of alternative counter hegemonic movements emerging out of a, 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 a out of the a, a partnership between uh, the private sector, the state and all of its ideological apparatuses imposing consciousness onto the masses. I, I just don't see it. Jamo, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, well, look, I mean, it's uh, I think. I think that analysis is is in terms of the of the power of this ideological superstructure, the 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 ideological apparatus that has in fact merged with the state, is uh, an objective reality. It is very difficult. Uh, I would not though uh, characterize it as as impossible, but we can't downplay the difficulties. We can't pl downplay the the ability of the of the state. Uh, to uh, to impose its uh, worldviews, its values uh, on the masses of people, uh, in particular in this country, also unite with the uh, notion that in other parts of the the non West, uh, in parts of Africa, in Latin America, that ability to impose this uh, all encompassing uh, uh, ideological perspective is not as strong. Um, and that's where we we see the the most promise in terms of building real alternatives and real counter narratives that are developing. Um, and so, yeah, the, 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 we we face some particular kinds of difficulties in the north. But I would argue we that we need to be careful that as we are immersed in the realities in these northern states uh, and the difficulties we face. Uh, that we don't allow those difficulties to uh, to uh, 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 undermine our ability to see other kinds of developments taking place um, in the in the global south in the world, because basically it, it is our ability to assist uh, those developing models, those developing projects uh, in the center of empire that's going to make those. Uh, developments relatively successful and help with the continuation of this shift in the balance of forces we talked about at the top of this program. Uh, so we have a particular kind of set, I believe, of responsibilities in the North. Uh, I think that, that, that we can't afford uh, to, to, to resign ourselves to the almost inevitable grip uh, that the bourgeoisie has on the, on the minds and consciousness of people in this country, and we're not going to be, you know, we're not going to be, you know, overly sort of, you know, naive about about uh, what we're up against. But I would argue again that, uh, you know, if we're not talking about mass-based politics, uh, there will be the driving force for social change. What social or class force, uh, Comrade Paul, are we in fact talking about that's going to bring about any kind of change, or are you suggesting that change is impossible? Now, I'm not suggesting that change is impossible, but I am suggesting that change, uh, uh, qualitative change, will not emerge out of the metropole, or in this case, 
the hegemon uh uh the u.s I, I i just don't see it even when young people you know flock behind the whole bernie movement the B bernie sanders movement uh they all did it holding their iphones and and uh uh watching atlanta housewives etc which, which uh for me was not calling for fundamental change in the face of uh capitalist exploitation climate change etc uh so i'm not saying change is impossible i'm just saying change will not emerge out of a, a, a place in which consciousness is determined by those in power i i just don't see it i think in that instances uh, in those instances, Althusser, Pierre Bourdieu, and most of these other structural marches were 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 on point in highlighting the role that uh, 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 the media, the police, uh, the streets, all of these ideological superstructures play a role in determining how we see the world, how we see change, and how we manifest change. So it's for me, it's only in places in which people still have a, a, a fundamental connection to nature itself outside of the idea, the outside of the ICC, outside of the, the uh, World Bank, outside of the IMF, will we see fundamental change? That, that's all I'm saying. I, so for me, Africa, Haiti, um, well, come, 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 come! Let me jump in. But so, ahead, what? How? How does that change take place? Is it through some kind of, of magic? It, what social forces? Yes, I believe it's revolutionary. Uh, I based on what? It, based on what social forces? Uh, when you say based on what social forces, we're talking about people who are being exploited, exploited by a system that is put put in place via its political economy. So for me, the only alternative. So you're suggesting that it's going to be the working class that will lead this struggle. Um, and it's not. I, I won't suggest that. I, 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 it's the peasant class that will lead this struggle. <laughs> if so I may borrow from lump it? Jacques Romain, is it lump it? I believe so. Yes, those who have not been interpolated in in, in bourgeois. Yes, that's only not very they, Marxist. It sounds more Maoist than Marxist. It uh, it, it, it is. is. It is. And not only that, but we've been we've been we have been we been there, done that. We've done the lumping bullshit. The basically, oh. we we did that. Have already. we though? And have we though? Yes, we have. Because that was I, the basis. I don't think so. Well, right, right now lump we're in the same conjunction where that's required as well. Let, let's look at when we did it, brother. It's the same yeah, yeah. conjunction. We have super, we have super exploitation taken, and I don't like the term neoliberalism. It is ne it is li liberalism, the liberalism exactly. of the thirties. Yeah. Classical, yeah. Classical li liberalism, absolutely. Yeah. Juxtaposed against uh, 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 or supplemented with a finance capitalism that is juxtaposed an industrial model like China and Russia. Same thing we face in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Same conjunction. So it begs the question: What is the what is the solution? The solution is what Burkina Faso and Mali is doing. You have to pick up the gun and fight. That's the only other solution: is either die. I, I will only. say this. I will say this. If you if you guys want, to, um, I think, and not to be redundant, part of the problem we have in the West is that there has not been enough political education of any faction in the West outside of the, the Latin and South American countries of what class consciousness means, whether they be lumping, whether they be proletariats, whether they be petit bourgeois, class, potential class traders to their class. I think that we need to have a basic under, definitional understanding of people of what is class hierarchy, what does it mean to engage in class warfare? What does it mean to have political economy? What does it mean to have wealth extracted for your labor? You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying, and I'm not saying we should do that under the assumption that we're turning people into Marxists, but to having a basic comprehension of realizing why is it that capitalism and what is professed to be called the richest country in the world is not working for you? And what does it mean when you have a political economy and a hierarchy of superstructures and class tiers in which only 1% owns a supermajority of the wealth and everyone else is fighting for scraps because there are no crumbs? 
And what does that mean in terms of capacity to challenge those that are putting you in a position, even though they may look like you in terms of your skin, that will use their skin proximity to you to tell you, come on, brother, let's fight the white man, when in reality, they're working with the white man to stick to stick a shiv in your back. Can I ask a question, though? I mean, it, that's that's if if it's true that uh, there's this, this all-encompassing grip on the consciousness of people in this country. We, and we're talking about the North now. Mm-hmm. Um, and if it's true that oh, part of the explanation for the weaknesses of the left uh, in the U.S. is because of the low level of political consciousness, the lack of political education, et cetera, et cetera. My question then becomes, what for what social force would be responsible or might be in the best position to in fact engage in that political education that political education and i would assume organizing and if we identify those social forces then how successful can they be if it's true that basically the bourgeoisie has a, a such a total grip on consciousness I think that's a very good question, John. And my position is this, right? I would argue that number one, and I've said this before, and I think you may agree, we don't have a left. We have leftists, but we don't have a left. We don't have a left in the sense that it presents an ideological counter-hegemonic force to the liberals and the reactionary right. We are basically a group of people who can fit in a decent-sized basketball gymnasium, pretty much. And that includes the black and the white left, pretty much. That's not a left. And part of the problem is, even amongst all of us, most of us are downwardly mobile, university educated, you know, alabasters or Negroes. <laughs> so our class proclivities are not about organizing in union spaces, are not about talking to CNA workers. You know, we might go talk to the kids who want to get together on the campus in the student union about, like, you know, trans issues, which is cool. But when are we going to be? What about how come no one wants to say, you know, where's the union hall? Let's talk to the black bus drivers. Part of the problem I have with our black left formations since the late 60s, including the late 60s, is that they're not rooted in the black working class. We have black unions in this country that are very good at organizing, that are already rooted in understanding class consciousness. Why aren't we talking about mobilizing and radicalizing black and white union cadres, starting with the black union cadre and having them reach out? I've never heard this strategy from anyone on the black left. I'm not sure who you who you associated with it because I mean, well, I, I heard I hear, some, but yeah. you know, and, I, and I'm hearing I'm hearing your boy a lot here. I'm hearing Reed, um, <laughs> and, and and you know, and I guess I like Reed. I like Adolf. I know Adolf, <laughs> uh, but he has some 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 serious limitations also. Well, we everybody, everybody, everybody understands that that the, again. Now we're getting someplace in terms of identifying the 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 agents or potential agents for for change. And you are making an argument that has to be uh, the working class. Um, And I will agree with that. And part of the challenge we do have is that many of our organizations don't have a serious base in the working class. And that has to be the objective. Someone has to start someplace, uh, Africans. So even though we make the analysis of how weak the left is, then the question becomes, well, who is doing the work to begin to build this left that we don't have? And some of us are tempted to, in, try, in fact, try to do that because if we don't organize, then we are never going to be able to build a resistance. The potential is there, I, I argue, because you, you're right, uh, Comrade Paul, the mm-hmm. conjuncture is different. That basically here you have, you have a concentration of wealth and power among the bourgeoisie in today that you didn't really have in the 1930s. And as you all have p- pointed out, and we all agree, you, in the 1930s, you had a relatively uh, 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 strong left or developing left that can challenge the, 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 the power of the bourgeoisie to the extent that that's what, uh, you know, forced them into the, the, the reforms of the so-called New Deal. Today, we don't have that. And that's why this, this your description, uh, Comrade Paul, of the fascism that we are experiencing today is really spot on. 
because we are living in a fascist uh, society uh, with fascist power concentrated uh, with these neoliberals or these classical liberals. And the ability to, to, to resist is shrinking every day. So the, the, the urgency of the moment in particular here in, 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 in North America, is of uh, the absolute necessity of building some organizations where we can, in fact, engage in that political education we're talking about that we have to have. We just can't, we, we, we just can't do it by magic, a magical thinking. It is, it is the systematic, uh, persistent, uh, unglamorous organizing work that has to happen. And, and we have to rebuild a whole new, or a couple of generations that don't have that kind of orientation. And I mean, most people today, when they come up and they want to get involved in struggle, their model of, of struggle is what? The NGOs. Okay. Mm. And they bring those experiences in our attempts to build movement. And so part of our struggle, even in bringing those elements in, is having to, uh, to struggle against those kinds of tendencies. Absolutely. So, you know, we, we, these are all the practical challenges we have in terms of how you make revolution. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. I'll say one thing. Uh, this is where I disagree with Pascal. I don't even talk about you. I've never said anything about the left because the left, especially in the North, has been co-opted by the identity politics. It, 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 you could forget it. There's no Marx. When you speak the quote unquote leftist, there's no Marxist analysis. You get one of two things. You get Keynesian when you speak to anyone on the left or you get identity politics. So I don't even think about the West in that sense in a, 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 as a revolutionary counter hegemonic force against capitalism. The second thing I want to mention is Pascal talks about labor organizations, blah, blah, blah. When you speak to the average person in a blue collar work or the lumping proletariat or the proletariat, what exactly do they have in mind? Are we as scholars, as persons concerned about the poor, are we trying to impose uh, uh, our own understanding of what freedom means against capitalism. Because when you speak to a person, a lump in proletari proletariat, their conception of labor organ organization is to eventually be part of the 1%. Their vision is still the American dream under capitalism. There's not too many people in the lump in proletariat working at McDonald's, driving an Uber, who does not have the aspiration that ultimately they will be a millionaire <laughs> driving an Uber over a lifetime or want some sort of life. And this, but it, it goes back to the beginning of this discussion. This goes back to the hegemonic, the fascistic nature of the American, uh, uh, of American society itself, wherein even the poor themselves, those you're trying to organize are fighting against your conception because at the heart of it, we both we all can agree that the problem is capitalism itself. Capitalist, capitalist relations of production is the problem. It should not be, as Polanyi pointed out, the means by which we organize social relations. And until we can teach those we're trying to organize that the problem is the social relations of production under capitalism by so our social relations with one another as determined by capitalism is the problem until we do that resolve that issue any sort of social movement coming out of the north will reproduce the same foolishness we see that's been reproduced since the crash since the 1930s i think the only way you do that if we actually have physical organizing not digital in meat spaces go to right. local high school gymnasiums people that have barbecues, tag team football, people come out, talk about politics, do a grassroots political education. The one one of the things that I think that we had we did right in the 60s was the SNCC, Ella Baker uh, political education strategy. I think we might need to take some of that and have us create ways we have Black Alliance for Peace, have merge, uh, regional conferences in the hood, and we just talk to people in the neighborhood. Hey, I off. I said this before. I know it sounds corny to people. Why can't we have Black Alliance for Peace, cadre, take over the infrastructure of DSA, make that a radical organization, get these alabasters with their weak politics <laughs> and then sock them politics out of here. That's a formation that has inroads into politics. It's in all over all over the country. It's ripe to be taken over. 
Why can't we use these petite bourgeois black organizations who love the Democratic Party? Okay, we've got DSA. It's got a foot in the Democratic Party. Radicalize these worthless Negroes with discourse about class consciousness, class warfare, materiality. Have them funnel themselves into a DSA, get them out of the right flank of the Democratic Party, and at least get them to a more radical flank of the Democratic Party and create internal uh, contradictions within the party and maybe we can break it if not have influence in it to move it to the left i'm not saying that this is going to happen tomorrow but it's going to take some kind of movement out of this lethargy that we're in but not to be sounding like i'm hogging up the show because we're at our hour mark does anyone have any clothing thoughts or statements <laughs> <laughs> well I will, i'll start by saying this has really been a very stimulating conversation and I would uh, just comment on your last um, uh, statements, uh, uh, Brother uh, Pasco, that basically I think that th that strategy for some group uh, to attempt to uh, go into those into that formation is something that some someone can pursue uh, at the Black Alliance of Peace. However, uh, we are centering, we have a strategic f focus as laser uh, focus on uh, building the African resistance, the African working class resistance, uh, attempting to root ourselves in the African communities. Uh, and so we, we, we hold up and we center the, the, the African working class and the absolute necessity for organizing our people. So that for us is the strategic, uh, the main strategic objective. That's the only way one builds movement. And I'm opinion. not saying you should abandon that, but the thing is yeah. so that works well for 14% of the population, but you're going to need cadre in other communities to work with you to smash capitalism. Yeah, yeah, and we and, and those things happen. I mean, you're not, you're not organizing, building, and struggling in isolation, but in terms of a strategy, in terms of where you put your precious time resources, you know, that that's that where we're going right now. Uh, but we it can happen because, as you said, these formations are really... You know they're there to be to be sort of picked off if you will but right now we believe that we've got to organize our people because we all have have concluded and agreed on that we are at a level of disorganization that we have, i've never seen you know and I'm, I'm i'll be 70 in a few a few months and it's my understanding of of of, of our realities that this is a level of disorganization and lack of consciousness that we have never experienced before and so, you know, we, the, the window of opportunity for reversing this is, is, is really uh, uh, closing us pretty quickly. So I would say that the task still uh, is to, to build organization. It is still to engage in these kinds of conversations where we, we struggle around an understanding of what we're up against. Uh, but we also try to move toward how do we address these internal contradictions? How do we, in fact, build more effective movement? Because we have no other choice but to do that or, or just jump out the window and say, fuck it. Paul, you have any, any closing words? I'm not as hopeful <laughs> as you do. Uh, my hope right now, I, um, I do view what's happening in Eastern Europe, what's happening with the alliance between China and Russia uh, uh, as an emerging alternative to neoliberal capitalism. Um, and my hope is in the on the African continent. And I have a glimmer of hope in Haiti. But outside of that, brother, anything coming out of the the global north or even Latin America, I'm suspect is suspect for me. Well, all right, brothers. I appreciate you joining us here on the Mile Mile Hour. Continue to check out This is Revolution podcast tomorrow night. Jason and M2 Sun. I think Cooper's gonna be on the show. I think they're talking about uh something about horror films in soviet russia i don't remember because i'm on vacation till the end of ramadan and we are out if i tell any secrets of the mao mao this oath will kill me if i am called in the night and refuse to come this oath will kill me if I see anyone steal white man's property, I must help him. I must hide what he gives me and say nothing, or this oath will kill me. The whole system in this country, the economic system, is such that 
uh, jobs are scarce. Automation is limiting jobs. It's, it's, it's decreasing jobs. And uh, if autom as automation eliminates the job opportunities, legislation will not create job opportunities. All it will do is bring about friction and hostility between the two races. You, you see, there will be no uh, progressive revival if black uh, folks are not deeply involved in it. I will obey all orders of the Mao Mao, or 